All right, I've talked before about baptism, um, and so this time I'm, uh, when I talked about the sacraments, this time I'm only going to talk about the basics of baptism. Uh, that is, what is what's necessary to to give it the matter, the form. Next week I'll talk about the uh, the effects of baptism, and then there'll probably be a third lesson on the other types of baptism, water and and blood. Um, there are two sacraments. Our, our Lord, of course, gave all the sacraments, and they you can see them in the scriptures. But there are two sacraments that seem to appear more often than the others, and that he seemed to spend a great deal of time on more so than the others. And baptism is one of those. I'm not saying that it's more uh, that it's more important than the Holy Eucharist. How can you compare I mean all the sacraments are are, are beautiful and the Holy Eucharist certainly is is magnificent, but baptism why our Lord probably spent a great deal of time on baptism is that it's an essential sacrament. Without it, you can't even receive the Holy Eucharist. So, when was it instituted? Um, we don't know this exactly. We don't know for sure. A lot of theologians and a lot of holy people seem to think that it was done right after our Lord himself was baptized. Maybe that he just turned around and then and showed the apostles and Saint uh, Saint John how to do it. Um, I'm not th saying that Saint John was doing it wrong. It was Saint John's was meant, as our Lord said, as a prefigurement. It was it, but it didn't take. It didn't give the same effects that the baptism, his the baptism, that he would give us. Um, Baptism, of course, one of the reasons it show that baptism is so important and so essential is that Christ allowed St. John to baptize him. And when St. John did baptize him, the heavens opened, God the Father spoke, and the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. The, God the Father said, This is my beloved Son, of, in whom I am well pleased. You had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In every baptism, you have the coming of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is why it is so necessary. This is why it's so beautiful. You have the coming of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And each one is doing something different in your soul. And we'll talk about that next time. So every sacrament gives you an outward sign. And the outward sign reflects what is happening inside. And our Lord did this on purpose to show us what was happening inside. What we couldn't see. He was knowing us frail human beings. He was showing us unbelievers what was actually going on inside. So water baptism means to cleanse by dipping. It's come from a Greek word. A Greek word. It means to cleanse by dipping. And Christ chose water as the outward sign in baptism because it baptism cleanses us. He shows that our souls are made clean by the, from all the stains of sin which are then removed. This is how it cleanses us. It takes away all sin and all the stains of sin. When we, when we come from the waters of baptism, we are as, as bright and beautiful as Adam and Eve were on the day of their creation. Notice three important um, things that our Lord says when he says to the apostles. Go therefore 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is from Matthew 28, and it's verse 19. Our Lord said to this to the apostles just before he ascended into heaven. It was one of the last things that he told them. He had by this time taught his apostles how to do all of the sacraments. He spent a great deal of time training them, instructing them. And he's now about to leave them. And one of the last things that he says to them is this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The therefore means that, as I've told you, go you then, now, as I've instructed, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. The first thing that he tells us here, he tells the apostles here, is to baptize which implies that they already know how to do it, that they've been instructed in it. He's just telling them now, put it into practice. Go, therefore. And he also tells them how to baptize. Now, he's probably already done this, but he is reiterating it, making them understand the importance of the words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, the Trinity. Do not baptize them in my name. Do not baptize them in the name of the Holy Ghost. Do not baptize them in the name of the Father. Baptize them in our name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Triune God. And lastly, he tells them why they must baptize and why we must be baptized. Where does he say that? He says, he says that when he says, make them disciples. Make them disciples. Make disciples of all nations. This is why they have to baptize. Why we have to be baptized. Because we need to be his disciples. We need to be a member of his church. The only way we can be a member of his church is through baptism. So this shows the necessity of baptism. Mark also mentions other words of our Lord that our Lord spoke during baptism. There are, as I say, there's a number of mentions of baptism, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Our Lord uh, spoke to Nicodemus about uh, baptism when he came to him in the night. Unless you be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he spoke to the woman at the well about the living water that he would, he would give, that would take her to heaven. And she wanted this water. He said, I and this living water. Again, he was speaking of baptism. So when Mark mentions our Lord's, uh, talks about our Lord about baptism, he said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he who does not believe shall be condemned. In other words, if you are baptized, you will be saved, but if you are not baptized, you will be condemned. Again, this comes down to that idea that the church holds that outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. This is a dogma of the Catholic Church. You have to be a member of the Catholic Church to be saved. This comes from, from the Gospel. Here it is in Mark. So again, we see the necessity of baptism in these words. Baptism makes us Christ's disciples. Make disciples of all nations. This is what baptism does for us. It makes us his disciples. It makes us members of his church. And it's necessary for salvation. Because without it, we will be condemned. That's why the church has said that outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Very few things in the gospel have been stated as clearly as this. 
there are no ifs, ands, or buts with this. Be baptized and be saved. Don't be baptized, be condemned. Be a member of my church and you will be saved. If you're not a member, you will be condemned. We'll talk more about both that and the effects of baptism next time. And we'll talk about more about outside the Catholic Church, there's no salvation in the, the two weeks from now. So, and another, again, Christ said, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That connection, to be born again, to be born again to me needs to be born through the waters of baptism. To be stand as Adam and Eve again, clean and pure from the moment that they were born from the mind of God. Unless a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's from John. So, it's so essential and it's so necessary. So, how do you baptize? The ordinary way to baptize is to pour water on the head. Now, it's important. The water must touch the skin. So, if you're pouring water on the top of the head and the person has a lot of hair, uh, the, the water might not go through all the way down to the skin, you know, because hair has oil in it and the water tends to just run off. Uh, so that's why generally the water is poured on the forehead. The person's bald, that's not going to be an issue. But, so, but generally the water is poured on the forehead um, rather than on the top of the head. In an emergency, where you can't get to any, get to the head. Let's say they're in a car accident and they're under the car and you can't get them out. And it's necessary to baptize them. But they have a hand or a foot sticking out. You can baptize any part of the body. Skin. It has to be skin. So, you know, you'll ro roll up the pant leg or roll up the sleeve, get to the skin. And you can baptize as long as it's any skin you pour water on that part of the body and say the words. But that's only if you can't get to the head. And only and if you're doing it, it's only in case of necessity. Generally, the priest should administer baptism. But as, in, as I said before, in cases of necessity, baptism is so necessary the church allows anyone to baptize. And then you have to say the words. While you're pouring the water, you say the words. They're not two separate actions. They go together. You pour the water, the water's hitting the, the skin of the forehead or wherever, and you say the words of the, to the Holy Trinity. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You have to make baptize in the name of the triune God. So I said this only happens in case of necessity because the priest is the usual minister of the baptism of, uh, of the sacrament of baptism. Um, when any sacrament is given, it is really Christ who is performing the sacrament. The minister is standing in for them. And if you are performing the baptism, you are taking Christ's place. Christ is acting through you. The priest, in when he gives a solemn baptism, which is usually performed in church at a baptismal font, the priest is standing in for, for Christ. And Christ is acting through that human being, whether it's the priest or you. In, um, as, but as, as I said, in case of necessity anyone can baptize and you have to understand this because I've heard other people someone just the other day told me that they um, their fiance was not baptized he lives in a in a in a Muslim country he wants to become a Christian but there's no one there to baptize him he said well 
get his mother or his brother, but they're not Christians. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to, there is no, there are no requirements. You just have to be a human being. There's no age requirement, no religion requirement. Anyone can baptize who know, has, who's old enough to know what they're doing. A Jewish 12-year-old can baptize. A Protestant 8-year-old can baptize. An atheist can baptize. A Freemason, if you can get them to do it, can baptize. There is, there is no religion requirement. The only requirement is that they have to intend to administer the sacrament. You can walk them through it. They, may, they probably won't know how to do it. But you can walk them through it. You can say, pour water on my head. And while you're pouring the water, I want you to say these words. Or repeat after me. And you say the words with them while they're pouring the water. You know, you, she could give him directions over the phone. Or if you were the one who wants to be baptized, you could give directions to someone to help to baptize you. Uh, the only requirement, as I said, is that they have to intend to administer the sacrament according to the mind of the church. So even if they're a Freemason, they're willing to go through with this just to make your death easier. They have to have that, and you probably will have to mention it to them. You have to understand that you are baptizing me into the Catholic Church. And, you know, this, in that you're going to administer the sacrament in in place of the priest for me. They just have to understand what they're doing and understand that they are administering the sacrament. So what is the matter of the sacrament? So the matter has to be, is of course water, but it has to be natural water. What do we mean by natural water? That means water that comes from a natural source, that comes naturally. It can be from any stream, lake, can be from the ocean, can be salt water from the ocean. It doesn't have to be fresh water, it can be salt water. It can be from your water bottle on a hiking trip that you filled up at a, at a restaurant, but it's natural water. It's true water. It can be melted ice or snow that has, because when you melt ice or snow, it turns to water. It could even be mineral water because some water, mineral waters come from the earth and with those minerals in it. But fluids, other fluids that may contain water but are not pure water can't be used. You can't use milk or juice. Even if it's 90% water, it's still juice. You can't use milk or juice or oil can't use other fluids. You can't use wine, even though the wine, yes, was made from water and crushed grapes or some other crushed fruit. You can't use it. In an extreme case of necessity, if there is no water around at all, natural water, natural occurring water, and you need to baptize, you can use tea or coffee or unmelted ice or snow. Would, though it really doesn't take that long to melt ice or snow. You squeeze it in your hand. But in a case of necessity, if you can't get natural flowing water, you can use melted, uh, unmelted ice or snow or coffee or tea. However, we're not really sure if that's if that's valid so if the person lives they need to be baptized again conditionally our lord god always considers the intention and he knows what the intention was when you use the coffee or, to baptize this person he takes that into consideration but 
is probably valid but illicit. So therefore, it needs to be done again, conditionally. Whenever someone is conditionally baptized, that is, you baptize in an emergency, you or someone else baptizes in an emergency, it should, if the person lives, be done over again conditionally by a priest. Why? Maybe you didn't do it right. Maybe you left something out. But even if you did do it right, even if you didn't leave anything out, it still should be done over again. Because the solemn ceremony of baptism has so many beautiful parts to it that were left out. You did the essential. You did the important thing. But all the other parts had to be left out. The exorcism, the blessings of the water, the, the, uh, all the, the, um, the lighting of the candle, all, the, all those things had, were left out. And so to get all the, the extra blessings that, that go with the sacrament of baptism, do it over again conditionally. The words of baptism must be said while the water flows on the skin. But the words do not have to be said so loud that everybody hears them. So if, for example, you were in a situation where the person wanted to be baptized, and you knew this, or they had just asked you about being baptized or whatever, but their family members came come in and their family are not Catholics, and you know that their families, the family would get really upset if you perform this baptism. They might try and break it up. They might yell. They might scream. They might give this poor sick person a hard time. So you want to perform the baptism quietly. And you can do that. You could take a handkerchief and soak it in water or something else you find and soak it in water and wash the person's forehead like you're, you know, wiping sweat or trying to cool them down or whatever and just wipe the person's forehead with the water and as you do so, say the words in a very soft voice or a whisper that only you and the person being baptized can hear. Uh, as you wipe the forehead, you can squeeze the water so the water flows over the forehead a little bit. It doesn't have to be a great deal. Wipe it away and say the words. There are three ways of applying water in baptism, and the church has used all of them. And uh, the, she uses them all, but she uses them in different situations that call for them. The first is... Uh, the one that the church uses the most, at least the Western church uses the most, is aspersion. Uh, excuse me, is infusion. That is where you pour the water over the forehead of the person. This, you, you, just the pouring the water over the forehead. Um, most of most Catholic churches in the West, that's the method that they used. Immersion is the one that most a lot of Protestants use and you find it a lot in the East and that is where the person is dipped in water or dunked in water they go down into uh, some Protestant churches have something equivalent to like a huge bathtub where the people go into it um, some churches will take their people down to the nearest river or whatever but they put they do it the way that they they, they see in the Bible that John baptized his people you know, go into the water and then they'll put them under the water. Um, the third method is called aspersion. And that's sprinkling with water. And that is very seldom used, but it has been used in the past when there's huge masses of people to be baptized at one time. For example, Francis Xavier used it in India when he had thousands of people to be baptized. To to baptize each one individually would be would take days, and his arm, you know, might not hold out. So he used aspersion. He sprinkled them with water. Now we're not talking about the asperges the way the priest does it in church, 
before mass where you know he goes down the aisle and sprinkles you and you get maybe one drop of water or none at all falls on you no he's he's using a branch probably has some leaves on it and he's dipping it in water and he is really throwing a lot of water on the people he's probably doing small groups of people as many as the water can touch so maybe 10 or 20 people standing around him and he's sprinkling them really well with water as he says the words. So that as the water hits them, he's, they're all being baptized in small groups. So that instead of having 2,000 baptisms, individual baptisms, he now has maybe 200 groups of 10 or a uh, hundred groups of 20 much easier to do regardless of the method the water has to flow and it has to touch the skin of the person baptized otherwise there would no be no washing which is what baptism represents in a solemn baptism done by a priest in church it's common to use baptismal water this is water that's been blessed uh, usually at um, the Easter Vigil, uh, sometimes uh, the Vigil Pentecost, and some of that water is given out for the for you know for Easter water you'll find in the back of the church on on Easter, and that's water that was blessed the night before at the Easter Vigil. But some of the water is put aside for whatever baptisms need to be performed during the year. Uh, but it's not absolutely necessary. If the priest ran out of that water, he could use any kind of water. And again, you don't need to have that kind of water to perform a baptism in case of necessity. So that's the matter of the sacrament. What about the form of the sacrament? The form of the sacrament of baptism are the words. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. These words have to be pronounced while the water is being poured, not before and not after. They have to be pronounced by the person who is pouring the water. You can't. This can't be a double deal where one person pours the water and one person says the words. Same person has to do both actions. You pour the water, you say the words. Do the, water ha do the words have to be said in Latin? No. They can be said in any language. Um, Spanish, Latin, English, French, German, it doesn't matter as long as you say the right words while you're pouring the water. And what is necessary is that, again, that that person has the intention of administering the sacrament of baptism. The sacrament of baptism that was instituted by Christ. Otherwise, the sacrament would be invalid. So these are all the requirements, the basics that you need to know about baptism, especially if you yourself are ever called upon to administer it. In most catechisms, the at the very beginning of the book or very end of the book, there is a there is a, a page where it says how to baptize in case of necessity. You know now how to baptize in case of necessity. You pour the water over the skin of the forehead, if at all possible, and say the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Next time the effects of baptism.